Ena mana, ena reo, ena hawefa, tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto katoa. Uh, good evening, I'm John Fraser, I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences and it's a pleasure for me to welcome you to this, our second of our inaugural lecture series for 2016. It's always a delight to see so many colleagues, friends and families here uh, from both inside and outside the faculty. Uh, the process of university inauguration serves two purposes. The first is an expression of acknowledgement and welcome, a reception for new professors joining the circle of esteemed colleagues within the professoriate. The second and most important is to showcase the subject and the story of the new professor, their maiden lecture as an esteemed and eminent academic at the University of Auckland. The inaugural lecture series is a highlight of our academic calendar and this year we welcome three new professors into the professoriate. So academic inauguration dates back to medieval times when it was unashamedly intended to impress upon the public and rich benefactors the need for their continued patronage. Indeed professors were chosen not only for their intellectual capacity but also their financial worthiness. One tradition required new fellows to be willing and able to entertain all their new colleagues for the duration of the inauguration, uh, sort of an academic joiner's fee. Today's inaugural lecture, you might argue, are only slightly more evolved, but are now a means of introducing our most eminent staff, thankfully at the expense of the university. In all serious, however, elevation to the rank of professor is a very serious process since for many it represents the pinnacle of one's academic career. The process of selection is long and involved and requires intense scrutiny by other senior colleagues who then seek advice from international peers to confirm that the appointee is internationally eminent within their chosen field. Inaugural lectures are a wonderful opportunity for colleagues, family and friends to learn about the journey that has led to academic success, the milestones, the decisions and the mentors who have assisted and helped steer along the path. Tonight it is my very great pleasure to introduce Professor Peter Gilling. Peter is an eminent consultant neurologist from Tauranga and the head of the university's medical program at Tauranga Hospital. Uh, it is my pleasure now to invite Professor Alan Merry, head of the School of Medicine, to provide a formal introduction to Professor Gilling. Professor Merry will then invite Professor Gilling to deliv deliver his inaugural address which will then be followed by some closing remarks from Professor Ian Bissett, Head of the Department of Medicine. Professor Mary. Thank you, Professor Fraser. Good evening. It gives me very great pleasure to introduce Professor Peter Gilling. Peter is a busy specialist urological surgeon working in the Bay of Plenty. And at the same time, he is an acknowledged world authority in both the research and the treatment of benign prostatic hyperplasia. In 2010, he received a doctorate of medicine from the University of Otago, which is a higher doctoral degree, recognizing his scientific contribution in this field. And on the website Expertscape, he is ranked sixth in the world in this field. On Scopus, which is a database that people like me use to figure out how our staff are doing, Peter has over a hundred publications, a very high proportion of which he is first author of. His work has been cited over 3,000 times, and his H index is 32 the highest for a urologist based in Australasia. Peter was elected to the oldest and most influential society in the specialty of urology, the American Association of Genital Urinary Surgeons. This organization has only 43 members from outside the US and only two from Australia and New Zealand. He chaired the Committee on Surgical Therapies at the recent International Consultation of Urological Disorders Guidelines Collaboration on Benign Prostatic Hypertrophy. He is on the editorial board of six international journals, has been visiting professor or speaker at over 30 international institutions, and given presentations at innumerable 
meetings around the world. He has been an examiner in urology for the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons and in 2015 was honoured with the Societe Internationale de Urology Distinguished Career Award and the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons Research Award. This faculty, amongst other responsibilities, is charged through the three schools that administer its medical program with training a substantial part of the future medical health force of New Zealand. One of our priorities is to address the national shortage of doctors in rural areas and in primary health care. As one strategy to meet this goal, we have placed great emphasis on the importance of sites like the Bay of Plenty. We have introduced a system of cohorting by which our students spend a year in places like the Bay of Plenty so that they extend their training beyond the walls of major hospitals in Auckland. And so it's very important that Peter was instrumental in establishing the Bay of Plenty as an academic site for the university in 2009 and has been the academic lead there since then. Also, he is a member of the steering committee and chair of the local advisory group for the university's Rural Health Interprofessional Immersion Program, based in Whakatane. As if that wasn't enough, Peter personally teaches students during their fifth year specialty surgical attachment, assesses sixth years following their electives, and leads the student pastoral care in Tara. Delivering our medical program across many sites is actually quite a challenge and depends on collaborative teamwork. I'd like to acknowledge the extremely positive relationship that Peter maintains with me and all the many academic and professional staff who work with you to this end, Peter. Thank you. More than that, producing future doctors who are fit for practice in New Zealand goes far beyond academic education. It requires active and credible clinicians who are also researchers and above all are great role models for our medical students. Professor Peter Gilling meets all these criteria, but in fact as a role model he goes further and importantly demonstrates by example that you don't need to work at a major centre to be all of these things to the highest possible standards. I'm looking forward immensely to his inaugural lecture tonight, which is entitled only men, dog, and chimpanzees. Professor Peter Gilling. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Only men, dogs, and chimpanzees refers to my research interest, which, as Alan has said, is BPH, benign prostatic hyperplasia. But uh, I'm pleased to see John Windsor in the audience because the other two titles of my talk are, I can directly sheet home to him. He asked me to speak five years ago on how to succeed in academic surgery from the provinces and I spoke at uh, a course for him five years ago and I called my talk Salutary Experiences and Immutable Laws to do with becoming an academic in the provinces. So I've uh, stolen slides from back then and then added the prostate stuff and uh, luckily there are a few urologists in the audience so at least some of you will understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> but of course if you're in the provinces you've got it all anyway. You've got the lifestyle <clears throat> and uh, we increasingly have the education uh, without the house uh, prices but uh, that's changing. And um, if we can add academic uh, associations to that then uh, we cover all the bases. So I'd just like to first of all just uh, back up a bit and give you some uh, idea of some of the research experiences I had in my early career which led me to this sort of pathway. And um, the first salutary experience was when I was a house surgeon and I was gifted the topic of reviewing upper GI hemorrhage for the previous 20 years by one of the well-meaning general surgeons uh, in Christchurch. And myself, as a house surgeon and a young registrar, whose name is uh, Dr. Stephen Munn, were charged with this task. Interestingly, after 18 months and 2,500 uh, case notes, 
and all our lunch times completely uh, uh, destroyed. Uh, we did come up with a publication, but sadly it was turned down for the two journals, we, uh, the only two journals who would have had any interest in it whatsoever. And so we came away uh, with no nothing to sh really show for that time. And so my first law to those uh, budding academics f from that talk was beware the meaningless research project, which masquerades as research. Because, and I try quite hard not to uh, send my registrars down that same pathway. My second brush with research was when I was a full-time research fellow during my urological uh, training. And uh, it was basic science. We got little strips of bladder muscle and hooked them up in an organ bath and stimulated them with drugs and electricity and things, and then tried to link it back to the patient's condition. And uh, and that was all very well, and another uh, registrar followed me, and then we came to writing this thing up uh, uh, for our theses, and uh, the supervisor decided that uh, all the methodology was fatally flawed and that we should cease and desist at once, and so that ground to a halt as well. I got a couple of publications out of it, but that was as far as it went. So my advice to the registrars is that research years are good, but... Um, the topic and the supervisor has to be locked down and uh, be given a lot of thought, otherwise you'll come away empty-handed as I did. The third experience that I'd like to mention was when I was in uh, Dallas. I did two years as a clinical fellow there and did a research program, uh, pro uh, did a research project. Once again, it was uh, basic science, but um, and this time it was uh, more molecular and looking at the uh, structure of the. Um, uh, smooth muscle and various things and it was a large uh, academic institution and I was part of a number of projects over that time but interestingly these were published but equally interesting my name wasn't on any of the publications so I came away again empty-handed <laughs> and so I would say that these uh, research fellowships and, and fellowships in general are absolutely invaluable in terms of the collegial stuff but uh, once again, it doesn't always work out for the best. And uh, lastly, I'd just like to mention at this stage uh, the fact and the support that uh, I've had in Tauranga to do the work that I've done. Um, I arrived into to a three-man practice and my partners Harry Watts and Mark Fraundorfer, they were very commercial and I learned a lot from them commercially. They didn't have a, an academic bone in their bodies but uh, we had a unique funding arrangement which uh, started the year after I got there. It's a capitated contract whereby the urologists had control of the entire budget and we paid the hospitals for the services that our patients had and it's still, 23 years later, it's still in existence. Uh, and it's really a seed and soil. They were really, f they really facilitated the stuff that I was doing. Didn't care too much for it, but it uh, facilitated it uh, nonetheless. And so I would say that your surgical partners also play a big part in your ability to do research. And here is where I'd like to acknowledge uh, Mark Fraundorfer. The reason he's not here is because he's covering me as we speak back in Tauranga. So uh, he would have liked to have been here. And uh, uh, yeah, he sends his regards, by the way. <coughs> but he really is, he was fundamental in uh, the assistance that I got with all my uh, research in those early years as a facilitator and he was actively involved in the early years as well. So moving on to the research itself, the prostate is, only, is a small organ the size of a chestnut that sits at the base of the bladder and the urethra, the water tube that you pee through, that goes through the middle of it. So as you age, the prostate can enlarge and there's a condition called BPH, benign prostatic hyperplasia, which has been the focus of a lot of the research projects that I have uh, been involved in. And it affects the areas that we can see here, uh, the transition zone and the periurethral zone, and they are right close by the uh, urethra. And we can see the normal prostate here, and then the glands overgrow and the, and the supporting cells overgrow as well, and we get this condition called BPH. And this is what people, most people uh, think of when they think of prostate blockages. They think of uh, a big swollen prostate leading to blockages of the bladder and 
the bladder getting thick and irritable and causing a lot of these urinary symptoms that you're probably aware of. And then that can lead to back pressure on the kidneys and ultimately kidney failure, but fortunately that's uh, rather uncommon. And uh, the prostate does uh, grow, there's no question, in Western men it just steadily grows as you age, and this is a collection of international studies that have looked at this, this topic. And it's thought to be sort of an imbalance between the death of cells and the growth of cells such that there's an overgrowth and a proliferation, and there's a range of different factors uh, that lead into that. But really, what brings the patients along to see us as urologists is a collection of symptoms called lower urinary tract symptoms and BPH is really only one of the causes that can be causes related to the blood supply, to the nerve supply, to the bladder muscle. There's a range of things that can lead to these lower urinary tract symptoms such that we get this sort of scenario where the green uh, circle is the, the patients who have BPH but only a proportion of them get enlargement and only a proportion of those with enlargement and symptoms uh, get blockages and it's really these ones that we're targeting when we uh, offer them surgery. And of course there's a whole uh, raft of patients who don't have problems uh, to do with uh, the enlargement of the prostate but still have the lower urinary tract symptoms. So you can see uh, this is why urologists are paid so much because it's a very complex and tricky area. <laughs> But as you see, the prevalence of BPH inevitably goes up. So by the time you're 90, it's something like 90% of people have the histologic condition if you look down the microscope at the prostate. But the symptoms uh, don't quite follow the BPH, as we've said. And this is a graph of symptoms and age. And we can see that basically by the time you're in your 70s, about 50% of men will have either moderate or severe oh lower urinary tract symptoms and a proportion of those will be due to BPH. And this is just to show you that we don't always reach for the uh, su you know, surgical solutions uh, when we're faced with these men with lower urinary tract symptoms. Uh, we're often offering education and lifestyle advice and of course uh, the inevitable drugs. There's a range of drugs that we use. Uh, the ones at the top you might use if you have a lot of irritation and then you, you might have uh, the ones at the bottom you might use if you're having uh, problems with um, storage. But um, you know, there's a range of different solutions and it doesn't always involve surgery, but I was interested in surgery. So let's talk a little bit about the surgical options. This is a uh, schematic from a good friend of mine who's now deceased, John Fitzpatrick. And uh, this is the operation which really defined urology back in the early days. This is what's called the open prostatectomy. Now if you can imagine that the patient's feet are towards the top and the head is towards the bottom, and we're looking down into the pelvis, and that's the bladder and the prostate. And so what we do is we open up the front of the prostate, and we've got Russell McElroy here who's done more of these than you can shake a stick at. And, uh, but I won't get you to talk today, Russell. To, um, and what we do then is we uh, open up the space between the BPH tissue and it sort of forms sort of a benign tumour. It's a sort of encapsulated growth. It's a prostate within the prostate, if you like. And so you can get in there with the index finger and scoop the prostate out, uh, or the BPH tissue out, and then you control the bleeding and uh, sew the thing up. And uh, this served urologists well for many years. Uh, but it does come at a bit of a price. There's a 25% a transfusion rate, there's a, a five to seven day hospital stay in most series, and it's a reasonably major sort of thing. So urologists moved on to uh, endoscopic techniques uh, 70 odd years ago, and this is the, 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 the bog standard operation that urologists do for smaller prostates uh, for BPH, and this is the so-called TERP. And in this you can see that we remove small fragments of the prostate and uh, the so prostate chips if you like and this is the BPH tissue and then they are placed back in the bladder and then we could, once we've scooped out uh, a channel in the, through the prostate then we flush these fragments out and it gives us a wide open uh, channel and usually the patient can have the catheter out in a couple of days and head off home. 
So this is the environment that we uh, were faced with in the late 80s and early 90s. And then arrived lasers. Lasers are really what uh, I've been interested in as far as BPH is concerned uh, for the last uh, 20 odd years. The original laser procedure which was uh, pioneered by my friend and mentor Tony Costello who's Professor of Surgery at the University of Melbourne, he first published an operation involving a wavelength called neodymium YAG, ND YAG, which you'll see the second bar on the left there. And the ND YAG laser penetrated quite deeply into the prostate. If you look at that uh, on, on the right side there, we can see that uh, we're down around this sort of range because the prostate is mainly 70 or 80 percent water. So this is, the, this is the absorption, if you like. The laser we use, by the way, is this one here where the penetration is only a millimetre or two. But it penetrated quite deeply. And what he did with this, using a side fire fibre, he sort of cooked the prostate from the inside. And he might have done four burns, if you like, circumferentially to the prostate and maybe do, did that twice. The whole thing would only take a minute per burn. And so the patient might have only been in theatre for five or ten minutes. And then... Uh, away they go. And, and that was fine, they often went home the next day, but uh, it did take a month or six weeks before they uh, really started to feel any better. And often they were quite miserable uh, throughout this experience. And that was the so-called VLAP procedure. So we had the fortunate uh, uh, circumstance that uh, a, a mutual friend of ours, um, this is myself and Mark, um, by the name of Mike Peterson, who is, uh, who is a distributor, a local distributor of medical products here in Auckland. He had a relationship with a large laser company in Silicon Valley called uh, Coherent. And Coherent Medical just happened to be the world's largest laser company, and most of their uh, lasers were for light shows and for industrial uses and so forth. And they just started to make a foray into surgical uh, endeavours and they'd had great success with the CO2 laser for skin and that was Mike's main interest but uh, they developed this laser called a Holmium laser which they uh, uh, had developed and we, we bought the first one they ever sold so we had a high powered Holmium laser and a neodymium laser in the same box and basically we used the neodymium laser to cook the prostate and then used the Holmium laser because it didn't penetrate very deeply to actually make a channel and that allowed the patients to recover a lot quicker but it was still pretty inefficient and time consuming. So that's, this procedure then evolved to a procedure analogous to the TERP where you just chopped out little fragments and we called that Holmium laser resection of the prostate and that's the next technique that we uh, uh, evolved and that really, uh, that really caught on uh, around the world. There are a lot of people who were interested in laser moved from the VLAP procedure to this procedure, which was the Holmium laser resection. And uh, it was still a bit uh, tedious and a bit inefficient compared to uh, TURP, but it was actually better for the patient uh, in terms of their perioperative or the time and time around the uh, operation. Uh, but it did really uh, cement the Holmium laser as a viable wavelength. And around this time, we were developing a relationship with some of the big instrument, uh, surgical instrument makers. And two of the German companies, Storz and Olympus, started developing prototype uh, instruments for us to allow us to do this procedure because it did require uh, uh, slightly different uh, tools. So we developed this relationship as well. All a lot of it was facilitated by Coherent, who were, it was good to uh, be associated with in those early days. So my, ne my next salutary experience would be to say that we, we had new technology, we had innovative ideas, and we had backing of a large American corporates. But randomised controlled trials are really the lifeblood of medical technologies. And so we had to start producing the science to actually make any sort of meaningful headway with the laser techniques that we were pioneering. 
And uh, my immutable law from this was basically the quality research uh, is, is essential if you want to carve out an academic career. And the randomised controlled trial uh, for the medical devices is the way forward. So the first randomised controlled trial that we did was comparing our resection technique to the VLAP, which was the standard laser technique that was used in the early 90s. And we pretty much showed that in every respect, other than the actual time they spent in the operating room, it was superior. And uh, we showed that even in terms of the, the blockage, the relief of the blockage that the patients had, um, that, the, that the holmium resection was better than the VLAP. And this was an important first step for us. The next randomised controlled trial we did uh, compared the holmium resection versus the TERP which was the standard procedure and still is the predominant procedure worldwide that in many jurisdictions that's changing. And this also was the FDA study for this holmium laser. It's, it wouldn't happen now because uh, now the FDA to get a 510k approval you need at least 50% of the patients to be done in the continental US. But this study was entirely done in Tauranga. Uh, these were all patients who had blockages and uh, we basically showed that it was identical to TURP in terms of the uh, effects, but uh, the patients did much better around the time of surgery. But while we were doing that, of course, we were rediscovering the prostate anatomy the old nucleation that we were talking about, it occurred to us that it was much more efficient to remove these whole lobes intact. And we were starting to see the surgical planes endoscopically. And if we have a look, what we then started doing, rather than chopping these lobes, this is looking down, this is a bladder eye, bladder's eye view of the prostate. And if we're looking down towards the prostate, we might see uh, two or three lobes to the prostate and what we then moved on to was to remove the whole prostatic lobe by getting into this what's called a surgical plane that we knew from our open prostatectomy experience and we were trying to enucleate just like you did with the index finger with the old open prostatectomy and this is a procedure that we termed holmium laser enucleation of the prostate and we first described it in uh, 1998. And this is what you see when you're doing a holmium enucleation. This is the BPH tissue here, here and here and you can see this is the capsule of the prostate which is the compressed prostate and we're finding our way into this plane and the, the lobe peels away from the capsule and this becomes a very efficient way of getting rid of this tissue. And I'll just show you this short video just to show you this plane because uh, the plane itself, when you see it, you can see how obvious it becomes, this whole enucleation thing. That was, we were looking into the bladder there and now we're making an incision into the prostate. And now we're, the, the lobe, the, the lateral lobe is here. And we're moving down and this is the plane between the compressed prostate and the adenoma. And you see how it peels? See that? A nucleation uh, and this is the plane that we're in when we do holmium enucleation and uh, this was a bit of a revelation uh, to the uh, uh, urology world though it did take a long time before uh, people really started to become interested in it but this is uh, basically the left lateral lobe of the patient and what we're doing is we're in the plane here again and the laser really it, it provides a bit of cutting, but it's really there just to cauterise those little bleeders, and you can see it just peeling away. So this is the whole enucleation concept, and this is what you might have done with your index finger when you were uh, doing an open prostatectomy. So then we had a problem. We had big chunks of prostate, sometimes as big as your fist, sitting in the bladder, and we had to develop a way to get those fragments out. So we started humbly, and this thing top left is an arthroscopic shaver. And so this is something that an orthopod, and I know Sue Stott's here, um, an, an orthopod might use in a knee. You put it in the knee and it nibbles away at the cartilage. Well, we put it through the tummy and nibbled away at bits of prostate in the bladder. 
uh, it was a bit of a messy business because <laughs> there was quite a lot of leakage around the uh, cannula and so forth, but uh, that's how we started. And then we convinced uh, the company we were working with, uh, Luminous, based in Palo Alto, uh, to um, produce for us a morselator, and this is the handpiece. These are the reciprocating blades, so it sort of uh, the blades sort of reciprocate, and then with the high-powered suction, suck the fragments out, and this is the motor in the handpiece, and this is the controller box which controlled the motor. And there's a foot pedal, of course, which controls all this. We also uh, formed an alliance with an Auckland company to produce a pneumatic one, which would plug into the uh, to the compressed air. So we were using all these good orthopedic props, so and um, uh, this was a little bit jerky though, it didn't really hold the fragments too well and this uh, was quite a bit smoother. So we went with uh, this design and with the company that uh, manufactured the laser, though they were a little bit out of their comfort zone with these me mechanical devices. Interestingly, uh, a few years later we came across the patent for this device and uh, um, unsurprisingly, uh, we weren't listed on the patent, even though it was our idea and we uh, developed it. And of course, there wasn't, wasn't a royalty to be seen, as you would expect. Uh, and uh, the, the uh, engineers that we were working with were all featured large in this. And uh, at this point, my commercial partner, Mark, he uh, threw his toys out of the cotton, said he wasn't going to ever work with them ever again, and he never did. And, uh, but I soldiered on. <laughs> So this is the commercial morselator that uh, Coherent developed uh, from that, that one that you saw before and this was the one that they produced in uh, 1998 and this is the high powered Holmium laser. And this is the, uh, this is the modern uh, morselator which we use, we still use the Coherent one but uh, we use this other one and, and there's probably four or five of these in the market now which have uh, been spawned directly by the Holmium enucleation procedure. So then we went on to study the enucleation procedure. So HOLEP compared to TURP. We started off working with and funded by the laser company, but as soon as they realised they didn't need this for FDA approval of the morselator, they dropped us like a hotcake and we had to we carried on and we self-funded this procedure with uh, our ill-gotten gains from pharmaceutical trials. And uh, and that's a model for funding that, uh, that uh, you know, you always need to consider uh, for surgical device trials because they're notoriously poorly funded. But anyway, we studied it versus TERP and looked at the durability at seven years. And so did many other people. So we did the first randomised controlled trial comparing whole of nucleation to TERP. But uh, there are now at least uh, 10 randomised controlled trials in the literature confirming our original findings, which were that the procedure was more efficient, that it was less morbid, you got rid of more tissue, and it gave a better relief of the blockage than TURP, and it was more fun to do and more cost effective. We carried on studying this thing. Uh, we looked at large prostates, we did a couple more randomised trials looking at small prostates, looking at other energy sources. So the randomised control trial has been very good to me over the years. And if you look now in the literature, you'll find over 500 papers on uh, holmium enucleation and every conceivable patient subgroup has been studied. And the randomised controlled trials comparing HOLEP with all manner of other things uh, still keep coming through. And it's very well studied to the point that it's now in all the gu guidelines and all the textbooks uh, in urology and it, uh, it has been called by many authors uh, the new gold standard for the treatment of uh, BPH and that's an American publication, Indian and Canadian publication and um, and this of course uh, all came from our endeavours in Tauranga. And you, if you look at the current inventory of laser techniques in the prostate and once again vaporisation and we developed holmium ablation, resection, we developed holmium resection and nucleation, we developed HOLEP and these were the first in each of the classes and all these others are basically, uh, uh, um, well they're not cheap knockoffs, but they are knockoffs. <laughs> but uh, some of them are okay, but essentially uh, apart from PVP, which we'll see there on the, which is the green light laser on the vaporisation front, I think that's a better vaporiser than HOLAP. There is no better receptor or a nucleator in my view. 
So the first, the next salutary experience, and my wife, my long-suffering wife Judy is in the audience, you do have to do the hard yards. You do have to go to the international meetings, sit on the advisory panels, do the workshops, uh, go to the meetings, be the, do the visiting professor things if you want to succeed in academic medicine. Visibility is very important and you do need to publish. You don't actually perish if you don't publish, but you don't do particularly well. So that's enough of lasers. I'd just like to give you a little a brief inkling of the research that we're currently doing uh, in BPH and that's probably uh, over half the publications that I've done are BPH related. We've looked at uh, medication, we've been involved in multi-centre st uh, studies, we've looked at prostatic injections, these are enzymatic uh, substances which shrink the prostate, uh, we're currently trialling a different sort of laser for a nucleation, um, we're looking at uh, stents, we've looked at biodegradable stents in the past. Uh, and we're looking now at some permanent stents on, on the back of some success that uh, other companies have had with uh, implantable devices for BPH. And the one I'm most interested in is the water jet technology. And this is called aquablation. And this is where we use uh, water, a water blaster in the prostate, essentially. And we're, we've linked up with another uh, Silicon Valley startup to do this, which does involve a lot of the heavy hitters in the medical device world and they support this research and uh, I'd like to mention that just briefly. This is the stent that we're looking at and this can be done in an outpatient environment through a flexible telescope and uh, we place this little uh, three-layered stent in the prostate and uh, essentially uh, patients who wouldn't be fit for surgery might well be treated this way uh, as a standard and uh, be, they wouldn't, wouldn't have to keep a catheter but uh, without the risks of anaesthesia. But anyway, moving on to uh, the aquablation. Now, water jets have been used uh, a lot in industry. Um, and you, when you use water jets in air, you're using quite high pressures, up to 90,000 psi. And you can use it on metal, stone, and wood. Uh, um, and um, there's a range of uses. But we're interested in submerged water jets, and of course there hasn't been much done on submerged water jets. There's the non-cavitating type, which might be what you might find in your spa pool, and fortunately that doesn't cause you any harm. But cavitating, when the pressures get up, um, they, are, they can be quite destructive in an aqueous environment. Uh, you do use lesser pressures, uh, 50 to a 500 to 10,000 psi, the maximum our device goes up to is about eight, eight and a half thousand psi, and uh, that really, uh, for the prostate and for the depth that we need, uh, is 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 what we need for developing a channel in the prostate gland. It does use robotics, uh, and once again, robotics are going to replace a lot of our jobs in the future. And this is a, probably an inkling. There's at least a half a dozen urologists in the audience. And this is an example how, of how robotics might uh, be replacing your jobs in the future. But most of us won't be, won't be caring, will we? <laughs> but this is, uh, this is the, um, uh, the robotic component. There's a couple of micro motors in the handpiece, one that controls rotation and one that controls longitudinal extension and retraction. And this moves the water jet from side to side and from front to back. And then we use this very precise high pressure pump, which very accurately delivers uh, uh, pressures up to 10,000 psi and there's a, another motor for active aspiration. The actual so-called aqua beam comes through a sapphire nozzle which is only 150 micron in diameter so it's only the size of a human hair but 150 microns a sapphire is used because it's very accurate it doesn't expand or contract so if you deliver a certain flow rate to that all other things being equal it will always deliver the same um, um, water flow and essentially if you can control the flow rate very accurately you can actually control the depth of destruction and this is what the water jet looks like when it's uh, attacking a piece of liver and um, you can see when we slow up you can see that the tissue close to the water jet is destroyed completely and the further away you get for it the tissue is denatured but not necessarily destroyed and obviously the flow can affects the destruction. So 
on the touch screen you can turn up the flow and that deepens the level of destruction and of course this can be done in the urethra. There is very little penetration into the tissue itself uh, at the limits of the destruction so you do have to still control the bleeding at the end of it. But here I'll show you a quick animation which shows the procedure. You, you place the handpiece, the, the handpiece is disposable. You attach the motor pack which has got those two little uh, motors in it. And then um, using the touch screen you've got a transrectal ultrasound probe in there which is uh, the imaging and then the technology marries up the uh, device and you uh, line up the device in relation to the ultrasound and it's all touch screen stuff. And I can tell you engineers do that better than urologists by and large, but uh, the urologists still have to come in at the end and control the bleeding. But typically it only takes one pass of this and it can penetrate up to seven centimetres in depth. And so it basically uh, takes out a channel in the prostate uh, quite simply, it takes about three or four minutes and then uh, the job is done in prostates we're testing up to uh, 80 grams in size which is about three times the normal size. And so we reported the first in man cases of aquablation earlier this year and uh, I'm one of the two principal investigators from the uh, water trial uh, which is, involves 20 sites around uh, the US and two in Australasia ourselves and interestingly uh, Tony Costello's group in, um, in Melbourne and it's another randomised controlled trial. So thank you all for coming and uh, my wife and my three sons, uh, my three sons couldn't be here because they were too lazy but uh, <laughs> no but they don't live in Auckland so that's their excuse so thank you and it's a great honour to be uh, a new professor at the University of Auckland. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. What a remarkable career. And uh, to think that you've produced all of that at, uh, in, in Bay of Plenty with, it seems, really minimal support from outside is truly remarkable. And it, and it demonstrates a f some of your characteristics. Perseverance is clearly one of them. You start with being knocked back again and again in terms of research. You, you, you start some basic science and you don't stop dis despite failing if you like and you innovate so you I would have thought once you'd made one of those steps that might have been enough to think we've we've got there but it's never enough it sounds like and now we've got the the water jet uh, technique um, I uh, I just have to take my hat off to you and the way you do it your innovation has not just been in, in your research. Your innovation obviously is in the way you work with others. Most people who are involved in such a, a dramatic number of randomised controlled trials are in a very big group and they have research students who work with them for years and you've generated that by your own hard work and particularly your organisation. And that's, that's clearly ha uh, showed your leadership in taking, taking that forward. The other key thing that, sh that speaks to me is your ability to build relationships and to man maintain them, even when, in a sense, you're not recognised when you ought to be. You continue to put, it, put in the hard yards and, in a sense, forgive what's happened and keep going for the sake of producing a better result for your patients. So it's been it's been wonderful here tonight hearing you say these things and hearing the journey, much of it is completely new to me. I've learned a lot about urology. Um, for a while I was a urologist, but the, ma the main operation I did was the one with your finger. Um, so to see now that we can do with water, that's amazing. Um, two years ago I was in Nepal and went to one of the urology meetings and two or three of the surgeons came up to me and they said, do you know Peter Gilling? And I was able to put out my chest and say, he's in my department. And my reputation went up like that. <laughs> so Peter, thank you 
Congratulations, it's been wonderful hearing this. It's a great example of persever perseverance, innovation, relationship building, and including other people. So thank you. Come forward for the plaque for tonight. Wonderful, Peter. What a fantastic lecture. I think all the men in the audience can now uncross their legs. <laughs> uh, that was an eye-opener, and uh, I think it's a testament to your, uh, as Ian was saying, your perseverance and your dedication to discovery and innovation, uh, while at the same time uh, always considering uh, seeking new and improved ways for patients, is the sort of... Uh, work that this university acknowledges and recognises as uh, being fit for a professor at the University of Auckland. So once again, congratulations on your election to the professoriate. And thank you all for coming tonight. Just to remind you that the last of our three inaugural lectures, uh, Professor Janie Sheridan is on Thursday night. Ja Janie is from the School of Pharmacy. So thank you all again for coming. Thank you, Alan and Ian, and especially thank you, Peter, for a wonderful lecture.